good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thanks for staying for this last talk. Uh, this is the end of the conference, and we really appreciate that you, that you stayed with us and you are interested in our, our talk. Even so that there is another talk in parallel in, in downstairs in the big hall, which is also looks very interesting, given by my colleague as well. So it uh, seems that the last two talks are, uh, the last two slots were given to the crisis lab. So my name is Levente Butyan. My colleague is uh, Andras C, and we will give this talk uh, together. So first I will uh, present some introductory slides, and then when we get to the technical details, Andras will take over. So. And there is a third person who was also involved in this work, uh, who is uh, Joao Salai. And we are all from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. We two are from the Crisis Lab, and Joao is from the Department of Automobiles and Vehicle Manufacturing. And we will talk about hacking cars. And yesterday, someone asked me whether we will bring a car on stage. And I, I told uh, him that, no, unfortunately not. And maybe this is disappointing for you, too. But hopefully, this is the only disappointing thing about this presentation. So why we don't br uh, bring a car to the stage? Because we, we are talking about hacking cars. But in fact, as you will see, most of the work we did was mainly on hacking an application on a PC, a, di a diagnostic PC, uh, which had some bad effect on the car itself uh, uh, as well. But actually, the bulk of the work was really ver uh, hacking the application on the PC. And that's what we may mean, uh, in fact, uh, 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 a Stuxnet style attack. But I, I will explain this later in more detail. So as you know, uh, modern cars are full of uh, embedded controllers, which are basically small computers inside the car, which control different uh, 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 things in the car, like the airbag, which was mentioned, but also uh, the, the engine of the car, or the a ABS, the, the brake, and so on. And all these electronic control units, ECUs, are uh, connected by in internal networks, communication networks, for example, uh, the CAN bus. Uh, in addition, the cars have different external interfaces, uh, like uh, most of the uh, modern cars might have a Bluetooth uh, uh, stack interface via which you can connect your hands-free set. Uh, some cars have a Wi-Fi hotspot. Some cars uh, have some GPS receiver or a GSM module, or uh, some cars uh, have some so-called wireless tire pressure monitoring systems, which are also wireless interfaces, uh, pre uh, present a wireless interface to the car. So if you put all these together, you have computers connected and there are in external interfaces. So there might be attacks. And uh, cyber attacks against uh, these modern cars actually are plausible threat. So people started to consider that. And uh, researchers started to work on that uh, early, as early back in 2010, 2011. And some of the, one, one of the landmark papers which have been published by a very well-known conference, Usenic Security, in 2011. It was written by uh, US-based researchers from well-known universities. And basically, in their paper, they show that cars can be compromised remotely. Uh, very, very nice paper that goes through uh, systematically overview the, the attack surface of a modern car. They identified uh, three types of possible surfaces, <coughs> physical access to the car, uh, basically via the OBD interface, uh, short-range wireless access, such as a Bluetooth interface or Wi-Fi, and long-range wireless access, for example, cellular, uh, uh, a cellular interface. So they uh, systematically overviewed these interfaces, and they developed practical attacks, proof-of-concept attacks, against each of these interfaces. So for instance, one of the, the attack that they developed was uh, exploiting a vulnerability in the media player of the car. There is a, a software there which parses the, the media file, which is played. And there was a bug in that software, a buffer overflow vulnerability. So they were able to construct a, a specially crafted music song uh, uh, file, which they put on a CD. They put the CD in the media player. And when the media player played the CD, uh, Basically, the, the bug was exploited in the, in the software, and they took over control over the media player. They also uh, demonstrated uh, exploitable vulnerabilities in the Bluetooth stack of the car that they investigated, 
or one of, one of the, the attacks that they constructed was basically, uh, they, it was exploiting uh, a bug in the GSM module, so they were able to call the car from uh, a remote location, calling the, you know, you know the, the normal telephone number of the car, and they played a specially crafted audio again, which uh, exploited the bug and, and uh, loaded additional uh, software modules on, on, the, on that uh, GSM module, and it was compromised. And once these modules are compromised, then you are already inside the car, and on the CAN bus, there's basically no more uh, protection usually. So from one compromised DCU, you can jump to the next one, and essentially you can take over the whole car. That's their work, that's what they have shown. And after that, there were some follow-up work. So one of the very well-known researchers who worked on that, who worked on that was Charlie Miller, with his uh, colleague, Chris Wallasek, and they Basically, their idea was to repeat the, the research that was done by these US-based researchers I just mentioned, because these guys, these academic guys, they, they did not publish all the details of, of, the, of the attacks that they did for good reasons. But uh, Charlie Miller and his friend had the idea of uh, repeating all the, the stuff that was done and publish everything. So basically, they come, up, uh, come out with a report that contains a very detailed description of what they did and all the tools that they used. Uh, <clears throat> and, and in fact, uh, some of you might remember that Charlie Miller gave a talk here at Hacktivity two years ago uh, uh, about this work. So we had already a car hacking uh, presentation two years ago at, at Hacktivity, which is actually on YouTube, so you can, you can watch it. And they continued the work, and a very recent result, you might have heard about that in June or July this year, there was a, 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 some news and hackers remotely kill a jeep on the highway. And this was also the work of Charlie Miller and his friend, very recent. And basically, they uh, uh, exploited some vulnerability in a Wi-Fi hotspot on, on this modern jeep. Uh, so they could remotely connect via the internet because the jeep had a, a public IP address. They remotely connected and uh, exploited some vulnerability in the hotspot software and remotely took over the, the control of the car. And there are other examples. So if you look at the literature, there is an example of infecting a car via the FM radio broadcast or uh, via the tire, or a dimension wireless tire pressure monitoring system or some uh, attacks on uh, relaying communication uh, between uh, the, the key, the wireless key of the car and, and, and the car and so on. And all those are remote attacks. So basically they, they mean that you compromise the car remotely not being physically present or close to the car or in, in the car. And they are, in fact, very intriguing and scary. We agree with that. And they can attract, of course, a lot of media attention because it's always a good you know, topic for a news that you took over a Jeep on the highway remotely. But their real risk, uh, may is, uh, in, in our opinion, is quite unclear. What, what we mean by this is that it is not so easy to do those kind of remote attacks, in fact. So they need, first of all, an exploitable uh, vulnerability in some of the interfaces or in one of the interfaces of the car. And there might be such a vulnerability, but it's not so easy to find such a vulnerability. So finding those vulnerabilities which are really exploitable, are far, this, this is far from uh, trivial. It needs reverse engineering uh, embedded software which is difficult. There is le very little information uh, available about these embedded uh, ECUs because the car manufacturers typically don't share too much. So very limited information from which you can start. And there is a risk of breaking relatively expensive equipment. So when you experiment, try to exploit a, a buffer overflow, you might actually uh, render the device uh, unusable. And you have to throw away and buy a new one. And this can be expensive. So it's not easy. And it may not scale very well, because a, a, a vulnerability in one of the interfaces, in one of the car brands, might not be there in another car brand in, in the same interface or other interfaces. So basically, with just one vulnerability, you can maybe uh, compromise a, one type of car and, and not the others. So that's what we mean, that's what we mean by not scalable. And the question we posed, is there maybe some fruits that are hanging lower, so easier to do than these kind of remote attacks? 
And that's what we mean by this Stuxnet style attack. So how Stuxnet work? Uh, basically, uh, most of you should probably know about this. And yesterday we had a wonderful talk on uh, attacking chemical plants. And the speaker there explained, in fact, what he showed a video, in fact, about how Stuxnet works, so, so you probably know. But the idea, just to repeat the main point, is that Stuxnet was a, a worm attacking PCs, first of all, and then modified the PLC that controlled the uranium centrifuges. But, but if you look at what Stuxnet is, it's really basically a worm against Windows-based PCs. So the idea was that you first infect a PC and took over the communication between that PC and the PLC. And then once you have that, once you control the communication, then you can modify the PLC, some parameters, or even override some of the programs. And then that has some effect on the, on the control system. And as I said, they exploited weakness in, in, in weaknesses in Windows. And the way they took over the communication was basically just replacing the DLL, which was responsible for the communication between a SCADA software used to manage the PLC and the PLC. So this whole stuff, actually, it's kind of a blueprint for similar attacks against similar type of systems. So if you have embedded systems, typically they are managed from PCs. And so basically that's our idea, to repeat exactly the same kind of logic in for cars, so you have some PC, which is a diagnostic PC used in garages or repair shops, running some software, which somehow communicates with uh, the car, for instance, uh, via the OBD interface. And then uh, if we infect that PC, that PC might change values or override things within, within the car, and that causes problems to the car. So that's the, that's the logic of, of our work. So why is this worrisome? Because PCs in repair shops and garages are probably vulnerable. Probably they are connected to the internet, very likely. Uh, they allow also connecting USB devices, and uh, mechanics probably connect all kinds of USB devices to those PCs. And they are probably poorly maintained and administered because that's not their main job there, the guys there to, to, to maintain their PC. And uh, probably they are also used for other purposes, not just running the diagnostic software. So if you put all this together, it's relatively easy, we believe, to infect them uh, with known or unknown malware. And once the, the, the malware infected the PC, then the malware can compromise the diagnostic application running on the PC and then implement stealthy, stealthy functionality. For example, and this is also what we were aiming for, we can implement a man-in-the-middle bit attack between the, the diagnostic software and the car. And then we have almost direct access to the car via the, the OBD interface. And this only needs a standard, standard in, 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 in quotes, of course, uh, reverse engineering of PC-based software, not, not very special knowledge about embedded systems. And we also believe this scales better than remote attacks because the same software is usually used to do diagnostic work on, on multiple types of cars, multiple brands. And uh, every car is taken to the garage uh, at least once a year or, or, or regularly. So uh, any, any car could be infected in this way. Uh, so for a proof of concept, we decided to demonstrate that it is indeed easy to do in practice. Uh, so in our test environment, we had access to an Audi TT, because that's a test car that the Budapest University of Technology and Economics is using for teaching vehicle engineers. And we have had, had access to that car for some time. And so we have chosen a widely used third-party diagnostic software, which uh, basically uh, is compatible with uh, this car or, or for the, all the cars with the, in the Volkswagen group. And we uh, try to make modifications in this diagnostic application to allow for man-in-the-middle attacks between the, the application and the car, which allows us uh, eavesdropping or modifying messages on the fly. We make the assumption that the PC is already infected by malware, so we did not write a malware for this work, but 
actually the parallel presentation in the room downstairs is, is about a malware type of sample that we wrote for, for bypassing different uh, 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 security uh, protection mechanisms. But this work was not about writing a malware. We assume the malware is there, it infected the PC, and the malware can carry out all the uh, uh, modifications on the applications that we do because we basically do very basic modifications. Okay, so the outline uh, of the rest of the talk will be that uh, we will present you the, the, a little bit more detail about the system which we, which we uh, investigated. Um, uh, some of the protection mechanisms that we discovered that the application developer uh, put in the, in the application but as you will see, it, it, they were not so effective. To, they, they did not prevent us to, to understand and reverse engineer the, the, the application and the protocols. Uh, and then we will go into the details of the techniques. So we will uh, show you how we replaced one of the DLLs of this application. So we do a very similar kind of attack that Stuxnet did. Uh, a DLL which is responsible for the communication between the application and the car or the, the diagnostic cable. So how we did this replacement. Then we explain you how we uh, uh, reverse engineer the protocol because there is a proprietary protocol between the application and the diagnostic cable. And we had to understand the message formats. There's also a checksum computation. We had to uh, figure out how it works because when we modify messages, we have to recompute the checksums. And there is some encryption scheme involved as well. So messages are encrypted in a, a certain way and uh, we had to figure out how, how this encryption works. And once we did all this, then um, uh, we can uh, then implement a man-in-the-middle attack, and uh, Andras will explain how we did uh, logging and replaying uh, sessions and how we modify messages on the fly. And then we will mention some of the experiments, the real experiments we did, including this uh, switching of the airbag, and we will come to the conclusion and, and some outlook. Okay, so let's start with the system model. So we have a diagnostic PC, we have a vehicle, and they are connected with a special so-called so diagnostic cable. Uh, on the PC, we have a software stack. We have this uh, diagnostic application running. The diagnostic application, in fact, is uh, the, the component which holds the necessary keys and the protocol implementations for, for communicating with the, with the cable and the car and it implements certain uh, diagnostic functions, which basically means that it reads and sets values inside the car in, in, the, in the selected ECU. And the communication, uh, also, so the, the software uses a number of DLLs, and one of those DLLs is a DLL which is responsible for the communication between the diagnostic software and uh, the cable and the car. And of course, uh, at the lower level, there are drivers which implement all the, the low-level communication functions. We have this cable, which is in fact not a simple connector, but uh, inside the cable there is a, a microcontroller. So there is a small uh, a PCB with a microcontroller and other components. And this microcontroller uh, is basically functions as a gateway. So uh, the application, in fact, uh, the application communicates with the, the cable. And, the, uh, and this gateway, the, the microcontroller in the cable, then uh, translates the messages and sends them or relay them uh, to the OBD interface of, of the car. So we, have, we had to work on this communication between the, the application and this gateway, in fact, uh, to, to modify and uh, eavesdrop messages. And we have then an, on the car the OBD. OBD, in fact, stands for onboard diagnostic, and most modern cars has this. It's, it's, a, it's a mandatory interface that car manufacturers put in the car for diagnostic purposes, to do diagnostic work on the car. And behind the OBD, then, there is the CAN bus, uh, which is uh, connecting the, the different ECUs. And essentially, while OBD is not equal to CAN, but essentially when you have access to the OBD interface, you have almost direct access to the CAN and you can send messages to the ECUs inside the car. So the application developers try to put some uh, protection mechanisms in the, in the application to prevent reverse engineering and, and hacking the application. So one of, one of those is signing the DLLs that they use. All DLLs loaded by the application are digitally signed, but for some reason they did not really check those signatures. 
So in, in fact, this looks like an ineffective protection. Or maybe they check, but we, we did not find where they check it. Um, they might check it somewhere silently, or we don't know. But, but in fact, we could replace one of the DLLs, so they probably don't check. There is some program obfuscation. So you, the usual stuff, they try to hide uh, the functionality of the progr program by, by obfuscating the code with some common and, uh, methods. Uh, however, when the application is started, uh, it deobfuscates itself in memory. So if you attach to the applic running application uh, with a debugger, you attach a debugger to the already running application, then you, uh, you can, uh, in fact, investigate the memory and understand how the application works. Of course, you only see the binary, but, but uh, that's why we have Andras, you know, who, who can read the binary and, and he understands how the application works. And there is some license verification, so you cannot use any, any kind of cable. The application checks that the cable is genuine, uh, you know, original, but there are fake copies that you can buy, and that's actually, that's what we do, did. So we, on uh, Amazon, we bought for, uh, I, I think it was $15, so we bought this Chinese copy of a, of a genuine cable, and it worked. So the Chinese somehow managed also to get the license uh, information and put the in, in, in the gateway or in, in the EEPROM of the, of the chip. So we did not uh, have to uh, reverse the license verification mechanism. And then uh, we wanted to do this uh, man in the middle. So our goal was to really uh, develop some component uh, which can do eavesdropping, can replay messages or inject fake messages. And, uh, and one natural idea was to somehow modify the DLL which is responsible for the communication between the application and the car. So we could, for instance, you know, take the binary because the source code is not available, of course, and, and somehow patch the binary with all the functions that we need. But in fact, it looked even simpler to introduce a, 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 another a fake DLL, uh, load that fake DLL, and then that fake DLL would load the original one, and we use just the functions of the original DLL for communication, but since our fake DLL is loaded before, we get all the calls before, and we can do all sorts of modi modification before we pass the control to the, to the original DLL. So that's exactly the, the idea that we, that we implemented. And now I take, I give the floor to, to Andras, who will then give you all the details about uh, the technical part of the attack. Thank you, Levanta. Um, now well, let's see what we've got. Hi, I'm Andrew. <laughs> you may know that um, usually Windows loader loads an application to the memory and after uh, walks through its import table and gathers the necessary um, shared libraries, DLS, etc., and loads them to the memory too. So in this case, Windows loader loads our fake DLL named as the original DLL. After it loads the DLS, calls their, their entry, pro, entry point before uh, passing the control to the original application. So our DLL gets the control and extracts the original DLL to the hard drive and then reload back it again. So there you can see a chain. When an application calls a read or write function, then um, we could simply make a many in the middle attack and then um, and then redirect the call to the original function of the original FTD DLL. And when the call returns, we have the control again and we can return back to the original application. Uh, how could we improve our protection? There are some tips. Uh, firstly, you have to check, you have to um, take care of your third party components too, not just uh, for your own components. So you have to check FTD DLL, Windows DLS maybe, and um, data files that are placed um, in your program, that, that your program loads. So you have to perform um, digital, digital signature checks and CRC checks before loading anything and after loading anything. And you should do this periodically during the program runs and should integrate um, some or um, all of these checks um, to your many of your calculations. 
like when you are sending a request to disable the airbag, there you should place some um, empty holes in the message that will be replaced by the, after the calculations of the protection of the CRC or digital signature checks. And of course, you should use uh, proper cryptography algorithms, not just simple XOR algorithms, as you will see. To reverse engineer this application, we used, of course, our fake FTDI DLL. This DLL contains um, exports name like in the original FTDI DLL. Some, uh, some of them we redirect, we, did, we did redirect some of them, but some of them we modified to make, um, to add further functionality. For example, re FT read and FT write, we modified them. And there we can capture or modify the communication when the application calls us. Of course, we used a favorite old debugger to reverse the diagnostic application, cheat engine for memory scanning, and uh, freeware AJXD X editor to viewing captured data, and some handmade tools for filtering that data. Usually, here, can see, here you can see a usual message. The header consists of three bytes. The first byte means the message direction. Now this means to the, the message um, goes to the cable, so send it by the original diagnostic application and goes to the cable. And of course, 4D means the application uh, gets the message and the cable answers. After that, you can see a size block, a size byte. Um, defines the size of this whole um, message, including the checksum. Um, and after then, the type of the message. In this case, it's a request message. And of course, B7, as you can see, is a response. No, after that, you can see the data block. The force, some of the force by, force first bytes are tar kind of target identifiers. After that, there is a data length identifier uh, followed by a sync byte. That sync byte comes from the original application because the developers um, leave it in the application as a simple C string. So, we named like this because they named like this. After then, you can see the actual data, data block that will the identifier target receive. Um, we discovered um, these checksums are, are to compute these checksums um, isn't to, too hard. So you can just simply XOR all of the bytes of the message, and you will get the checksum. Here you can see a simple acknowledgement message. This usually comes, comes from the cable, and um, that means the cable has done um, successfully an operation, for example. Of course, it is a type identifier that this is an acknowledgement message. Here is a key message um, used to initialize the encryption uh, session. This means B, B6 means this is a key type of message. Um, the key message consists of bytes. These bytes are indexes to a static table that the diagnostic application and the cable both have. Um, this table, this static table, consists of randomly generated bytes. And, um, and, you, and you, um, you also use XORs, the to perform the um, encryption. You can see in this example, um, you get the XOR mask from the table with the help of the key. And you just simply XOR, the, XOR it with the original message. And you will get the encrypted result. And of course, you then after then, you have to recompute the checksum. Here is the table, as I said. This is a static table, and of course, there are the key values, and you can gather, these are indexes, and you can get the real X or max bytes from the table as the following. Okay. Uh, 
when the application uh, calls our FT write function, we of course um, make a backup of the buffer contained in this function call, and then we can um, redirect the call to the original DLM. So that's how we uh, make the logging. And of course, when the application calls the reads function, that we redirect the reads. And then when the, uh, the original function returns, we can save the buffer, we can save the answer, and can return to the application. Before any kind of diagnostic operation, um, the cable needs to be initialized or tested. Um, the cable, um, in the, uh, during this initialization, the cable um, examines the capabilities of the car and the cable too. Sorry, the software um, um, examines the capabilities of the car and the cable, uh, speed limits, license, etc., and uh, store in temporary files. It stores in temporary files. Usually, these tests are run before any bigger operation blocks. Okay. Um, and you can see here um, the software checks the license. Um, if, if you want to perform a license check, you have to connect the, the OBD2 connector to the car. But you can bypass this um, protection with uh, connecting um, 12 voltage to ODB2 connector, pin 16 for plus and pin 4 for minus. And that will work. Here is a same, here's an example of a log we made. This log contains the requests and the responses. Here you can see the headers. Yes. And um, of course, the logging we made of. Um, I said the initialization, it's, it's called in the diagnostic software as port test. Uh, we, we perform port test, auto scans when, when the software and of course the cable scans all of the ECUs in the car. And of course the airbag control module and ABS brakes, ABS brakes. And uh, the last one is failed because may of the application um, less functionality or the cable less functionality. We, don't, we didn't know that. And an example for a replaying uh, session. These are messages only to write out. So we have a, a replayer tool and we replay these messages, messages out. Here you can see a um, um, bonus byte. This byte uh, you, that you have to send out before any kind of operation. This is a kind of cable initializing operation by oper uh, byte. Or, uh, or replay tool is a separate process. So it is invisible for the um, diagnostic application. And um, if, if we or if someone uh, want to perform FT write, FT write, of course, by using FTDI DLL, because our replay tool also uses the original FTDI DLL to perform write and read operations, you have to um, call these functions with the correct parameters before any kind of writing or reading operation. And uh, there are some hints that um, you have to wait after any um, sent out message. So you have to write delayed, delayed to the cable and will be perfect. Of course, the joker byte that you have to send before anything. And um, yes, uh, we could easily replay the airbag switch off and turn on messages because there is no need to change anything, encoding or data structure, anything. You just uh, replayed what we recorded. So that was a simple process. And as I said, this replay tool is a separate application, so it is invisible to the diagnostic application. Um, and yes, our um, fake FTD, FTD DLL can um, modify, also modify the communication. Um, as you can see here, uh, the um, application sends the messages in byte after byte style. So performs uh, FT write on each byte of the message. Yes, and here's an example of, of for this. 
here is a sample we want to match, and that we want to replace for original message. There we can find the match. And the, from the last byte of the match, we can modify the data flow and copy the others. And of course, we calculate the checksum. And um, I give the word back to Levante. And thank you. OK, thanks. So these were the technical details of how we can log entire sessions, how we can replay messages with, from a uh, separate application, invisibly to the, to the diagnostic application, and very importantly, how we can modify messages on the fly, in, as, in, as you saw in the last example. It was uh, our man in the middle tool running in the, in the fake DLL and can change anything in a message which was sent out by the, the application or received uh, from the cable. And with all these tools equipped, then we, we made some experiments. And this is just to show you some, some of the, the, the pictures and, and some of these things that we did. So, so here is this Audi TT on, in the garage of the, of the university. And this is Andra sitting here and having fun. Uh, <clears throat> all these experiments were carried out uh, during spring 2015. And uh, so this slide shows you that the diagnostic application itself uh, produces some log files, simple text-based log files. And we just wanted to check whether uh, we also see the same content in our own special log files that we make with the man in the middle tool. And so here is uh, the original log. Here, here is some parts of the, of the logs that we made. And certain things you see so these values uh, show up in, in our logs. So this was just a, a check of a full scan. And the replay of, of the airbag uh, enable disable message, uh, as, as uh, Andras explained, it was just a very easy replay of previous re recorded messages. So these messages, in fact, differ only in these two bytes. The sync byte is also different, but, but it is not really checked, or we don't really know what it is, uh, what's the purpose of that sync byte. So it, 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 this replay worked perfectly. If, uh, an, or, uh, an earlier recorded message with that uh, earlier sync byte uh, could have been, um, so, so it, it, it was able to replay it back successfully. Uh, and all the replays that we, that we were experimenting with were successful. So, uh, conclusion. Uh, so, as we try to explain, uh, uh, Cyber attacks on modern vehicles is a, is a plausible threat, but uh, research has started to focus more on remote attacks, and we, we argued that there are easier ways. And that's what we mean by a Stuxnet-style attack, where you don't really need to have very special knowledge about cars and internal components of the cars, but you basically uh, hack uh, applications on normal PCs. And we believe it has a much higher risk because it's easier to do and maybe more scalable um, and so on. And, and the proof of concept that we, that we made is, is just simply replaying an airbag enable or disable message, which doesn't look like very, you know, what's the heck? So why, why, why is it interesting? But this is just a proof of concept. So as, as we said, we have a man in the middle tool, which means that you can modify anything you want uh, including maybe firmware update messages. And another interesting thing is that you can also modify responses from the cable. So you can hide from the di diagnostic application if a value is set in a certain way, because when the, that value is read from the, from the car, then you modify the response from the cable showing a different value. So in this case, we just replayed back uh, uh, an airbag switch off message now the uh, mechanics come with the diagnostic software and tries to read the, this setting out from the car, and we can modify that setting that it still shows that it's switched on. So the, the, the airbag remains switch off, switched off, and the diagnostic application gets fake information because of the man-in-the-middle attack that we, that we perform. And that can be, of course, serious, right? Because if you can uh, switch off the airbags of thousands of cars, and it's not visible to anyone, then uh, any time when any of those cars have some accident, then it might have some serious consequences, of course. 
And as I said, you can also do maybe other things, not just switching off the airbag. So uh, a very small outlook to the future. Uh, we are, you know, this is a new buzzword, an internet of things. These are embed basically embedded devices connected via the internet. And, and if you connect these devices via the internet, then, then you, of course, create more risk. So, but the point is that, that what we showed is valid also for these embedded devices of the future. So basically, you manage those devices from PCs. You all know that when you configure your Wi-Fi router, you connect your PC and you configure your router from the PC. Or when you, uh, I don't know, later in, in the future, you configure your refrigerator or whatever, you probably will not have a, a, a pretty user interface to configure, but you will use a PC and you will connect to the refrigerator and, and configure the, that with the PC. So this whole logic, what we are advocating here, would work. So one could infect the PC and from the PC, all those embedded devices. And what is maybe more scaring, at least to me, and I would like to uh, you know, just bring this up as a kind of a discussion topic, uh, what if then, after some point, the infection disappears from the PC. The malware actually dis uh, deletes itself, for instance. Then how, how, how you will then detect that all those embedded devices are in fact uh, infected already? And uh, you know, I, I don't have a good solution for that, so I, as I said, I just bring it up as a question. What can we really do about this? How we can really secure the Internet of Things uh, when you know you have still vulnerable PCs which which are used to to modify or, or manage those devices. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>